Hi everyone, I'm really glad to be joining you this week and this new year in our meeting all together last Sunday at Panther House in our new venue. We looked at what our vision is as a church and uh, I spoke about our vision being to see multitudes uh, from all nations entering into God's kingdom, living for God's glory and prepared for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to talk to you today about our mission statement because our vision is a big vision. It's a, it's a faith vision. It's a vision, as I said on Sunday, that we can't do ourselves. The first thing we have to do towards that vision is to pray and to seek God for his hand uh, that he might move in power to enable us to do this. Uh, but what do we have to put our hand to work doing beyond praying? Uh, well, thankfully, we don't need to come up with a clever strategy because Jesus has already given us a strategy and we see that in Matthew 28 18 to 20 and uh, you'll know this passage but let me just remind you of what it says Jesus says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you and behold I am with you always to the end of the age. So the God-given strategy that we've been given is the strategy of discipleship. Do You see Jesus says there at the beginning of that passage all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He establishes his authority before he gives the command to go and make disciples. Jesus is saying, listen, I, I have authority to command you to establish your great commission and tell you what you need to put your hand to work doing. And then he gives us this commission, this commission of disciple making. It's a commission given from the king. And so as obedient soldiers in his army, uh, we have to heed that call and we need to put our hand to work doing it. Uh, discipleship was the simple method that Jesus gave his life to. If you look at Jesus's life, as we see recorded in the scriptures, his focus was a narrow focus. He did the works of the kingdom and then he taught the works of the kingdom to others through verbal communication and through demonstration. And in a nutshell, that's what discipleship is. Uh, we disciple people by communicating information about the kingdom verbally and also by demonstrating the ways of the kingdom uh, through our lives. So they hear and they see. Uh, we see through Jesus' life, he, as I say, he had a narrow focus, but his focus really was narrow because he gave himself intimately to three people, to Peter, to James, and to John. They were, they were like his little gang and they spent time together. They went up the mountain together. They prayed together. They got a lot more insight than his other disciples got. They were closer to him. Uh, so he had those three. But then he had a wider group, which included them, which was the 12, and they knew him personally. And then from time to time, he would go minister to the crowds and then withdraw. But in terms of sowing into people's lives, he had three close to him, and then he had the 12. And we see that over three years, the disciples multiplied. Uh, later on in the Gospels, we see the sending of the 72. And uh, this isn't written in the Bible, but I've always wondered, about the sending of the 72 and wondered how they were discipled and my little theory is that um as jesus discipled the 12 each one of those discipled six uh, others uh, so that the 72 could be sent out they did half essentially of what jesus was able to do and the kingdom of god grew and we see by the time we get to pentecost after the ascension of christ the 3000 are added to the church at Pentecost. Uh, so it was a narrow focus. It looked like Jesus was only investing a few, but over the years, his investment multiplied and it bore fruit into the thousands. And Jesus commissions us, uh, his body on the earth today, to that same method. And he promises us when he gives this commission in Matthew 28, that he will be with us to the end of the age. We only want to do what Jesus has commanded us to do 
And he promises that if we do, his presence will go with us. His authority will travel with us if we give ourselves to his command to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son and Spirit and to teach them to observe everything that he has commanded us. The strategy is simple. It's not a complicated strategy. It's a strategy to bring, bring people to God through Jesus Christ, to teach people how to love God, to teach people how to love their neighbours, and to teach people how to love one another. Because really, if we sum up all of the law and the prophets and all of the commands, they all boil down to that. They boil down to loving God and loving people. But here's the thing. This strategy, although it's simple and it's straightforward, it's costly when it's done properly. Uh, the temptation in ministry is always to focus on building a ministry rather than building people. Uh, let me be honest with you, to build a ministry that looks good on the surface is far easier than it is to build into people. Uh, but if you build a ministry that simply looks good on the surface, even if it houses a lot of people, you end up being like the church at Sardis, that church that had the reputation of being alive but was dead. There are many ministries that look big and look impressive, but and they look alive, but truly there's no substance to them on the inside. And we don't want to build something like that. We don't want to build something that's not going to stand the testing of the fire at the end. And so our focus has to be the same as Jesus' focus was, not building a ministry or a name or, or, or a building or anything like that, but building people, building into the living stones that make up the temple of God, which is his church. If we're doing that, if we're sowing into the lives of people, even the ones, the twos, even the threes or the twelves, okay, we won't have time to think about building an impressive ministry. That will take up enough time as it is. So we've defined a mission statement that we have as a church. And our mission statement is this. Our mission is to make disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, who are mature in love for God, their neighbour and one another. And when we talk about being mature in love, we're talking about having a steadfast love for God. We're talking about, and, and for people, we're talking about having an enduring love. Uh, we're talking about having a, a, a persevering love, not a fleeting love that comes and goes depending on how we feel, but something that's deep on the inside. We want to build into people's lives so that they are steadfast and they can stand the testing of this life and continue to love God, to love their neighbours and to love one another. So what is that going to take from our whole church family if we're going to go on this mission together and fulfil this mission together? Uh, I want to share with you three lessons that I've learned about um, making disciples. Lessons from God's word and lessons from my own experience. And this is uh, really lessons in effective discipleship. Uh, so the first one is this. Uh, if we want to make disciples effectively, you can only lead someone to a place when you know how to get there yourself. Just repeat that. You can only lead someone to a place when you know how to get there yourself. If I'm gonna go on a, a mountain trek, say up Everest, uh, the, 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 the highest thing I've ever climbed was Ben Nevis. I once did the, the 24 hour three peaks challenge and we, we just made it, but it knocked me ill. It was, it was pretty intense. Um, but just say I was going to go up somewhere like Everest and I'd, I'd not been up there before. I'd not done anything like that. It was far beyond my experience. I don't want a guide taking me up there who hasn't been there before. I want someone who knows the terrain. I want someone who's conquered. I want someone who can lead me, especially as I go up there when my sight's going to be hindered, when I'm going to get tired and I'm going to feel weak and I've got no clue where I'm going. I want somebody who is my eyes and ears, somebody who knows the way. Do uh, you know in the Bible there were a group of religious people who they cared about their ministry and they cared about their tradition. They were called the Pharisees. And Jesus said of them that they were blind guides. They coveted position. They coveted power. They coveted notoriety. But they had nothing of spiritual substance 
to impart to people. They didn't really know the way. They believed that they were a light to the nations, but Jesus said they were blind. And they ended up leading people into a pit. Jesus said, if the blind lead the blind, you'll fall into the pit. And that often happens in the church too, especially if people are trying to build a ministry, uh, which is far different from living a life of loving God and loving their neighbor and loving others. If, if, if their own only experience is building something that looks impressive, they've got nothing of spiritual substance to impart. We don't want to be like that. And I think we need to learn from what David says in Psalm 51. Let me just read this to you. David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. You see what David says there? He says before that he before he can lead others in the ways of God, before he can help people return to God from their sin, he had to be genuinely seeking God himself. He had to have his spirit renewed within him. He had to be walking in the spirit. He had to be walking in the joy of his salvation. He had to have that willing spirit. And he said, if I'm walking in the spirit, if I've got the joy of salvation, then I can teach people who are in darkness, who are away from God. Then I can disciple them. Then I can teach them your ways, O oh God. If he's not in the spirit, if he's not walking in the spirit and living in the spirit and knowing the joy of salvation, he's got nothing to impart to his disciples. You know, I, I remember I used to work at um, a software company called Sage. You've probably heard of it. And I worked there on the tech department and uh, spent a lot of time training to do that job, to know the software inside out, to know how to do accountancy so that I could help others when they phoned in. And I'd been working there a few years. And, and what I loved about that place was that the people who were my managers were people who'd gone through the same process as me. Uh, they'd been through the training. They'd done it for a number of years. So whenever I was stuck, with a problem, I could phone my manager and they would know the answer. Uh, what was a big problem to me was something simple to them because they were a person of experience. They'd, they'd walk the walk. Um, after a few years, Sage changed hands and uh, we got some investors in from another country and they decided to mix things up a little bit. And they brought in middle managers to take the place of our managers who they felt were better corporately. But these managers had never walked the walk. They'd never learned the software. They'd never been through the system. And so overnight, I went from having a manager who knew what they were doing, who could help me, to having somebody who knew practically nothing, a lot less than me. And uh, the whole place was chaotic. It, it wasn't a good work environment. And I think that's just a good illustration. It's a good parallel spiritually. Uh, because if we're going to lead people in the ways of God, uh, we've got to have walked the walk, okay? It doesn't mean that we're necessarily perfect, but we've got to have been seeking after Jesus and seeking to walk in the Spirit so that we have something to impart. And uh, I just want to lay that question before you today. Um, do you know the basics of what it is to live a life in the Spirit, to um, feed your Spirit, to walk in the Spirit daily, to, to have that rhythm of intimacy with the Lord, uh, where he's so present in your life that when temptation comes, you're able to uh, put those things to death and walk away from them because you have the power of the Spirit in your life. Uh, are you practicing these things? Uh, is your goal in life, is your primary goal in life to be successful in loving God, loving people uh, above all other things, and especially above being in ministry or having a ministry? Uh, so if we're going to be a family who are effective in making disciples, which is what God wants us to be, we need to be genuinely seeking to love God and people as our life goal. It needs to start with us. That needs to be the, the, the reason that we live. Uh, like David says, that we know that the love of the Lord is better than life. And we, we um, have a life goal. Success for us is 
growing in love for him and growing in love for people. And then discipleship will become the overflow of the true intention and focus of our hearts and our lives. It's just an overflow. It's not something completely separate. It just comes out of how we're living. So that's the first thing. We can't take somebody somewhere that we've not been ourselves. So we've got to focus to live that life ourselves. Secondly, if we're going to be effective in making disciples, um, you can only impart a a lifestyle to somebody uh, when they're close enough to you to see yours. Okay, I'll repeat that again. You can only impart a lifestyle to somebody when they're close enough to see yours. Uh, following Jesus is a way of life. Okay, it's not just part of our lives. It is our lives. For us to live is Christ. And people can only learn how to live that life of following Christ, which is an alien life to this world, if they're seeing others doing it with their own eyes. If they're witnessing how others pray so that they can learn how to pray. If they're witnessing how you read and interpret the scriptures and you divide the word of God properly. Uh, As they see how you relate to others who are causing you difficulty in your life. If you're in a family, is is they see how you raise your children and you deal with the difficulties that come from that. uh, And the challenges that children bring and that they go through in their lives. Is they see how you deal with conflict in your household and in your families in a godly way where you prefer others above yourself. Uh, as they see how you deal with adversity and suffering in your life. Um, as they see how you steward your money and how you give and, and, and how you're generous and how you make sacrifices for the kingdom. If you're going to make disciples, they need to be able to see all of these things. You know, I, I worked it out a few years ago that the average church meeting on a Sunday uh, constitutes 1.2% of a week for a Christian 1.2 percent and for most Christians uh, their, their their main source of sustenance their main source of discipleship is a Sunday meeting 1.2 percent and the rest of the week often they're either on their own or they're being discipled by the things in the world now I agree that there's a place for, again, like larger gatherings in the body of Christ where we come together and we worship together. I love being together last Sunday doing that. But that's a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the picture. You can't impart a lifestyle to somebody uh, by seeing them for less than 2% of their life. And that's why, as a church, we're seeking to open up opportunities uh, that we'd like to see on a daily basis where we can dwell together and actually spend time together and let people see our lives and impart these things to one another rather than being like ships that pass in the night so to be effective in discipleship we need to be willing to open up our lives to others and that's costly in a society where we've been brought up to believe that an englishman's home is his castle uh, and that you know this is my life and i might let you have a little glimpse of it but really you know, you're not getting any further than that. Uh, that's a part of our culture that we need to reject if we're going to be fruitful in the Great Commission. We have to embrace interdependence. And interdependence is when we realise that we need one another to be able to grow in the Lord. That's different from codependency. That's not where we um, are so dependent on somebody that we treat them as a god rather than going to Christ ourselves. I'm not talking about codependency, but I'm talking about interdependency where it's mutual, where there's iron sharpening iron, where we are growing together. Now, again, you can't do that with 20, 30, 40 people. Jesus did it with three and he did it with 12. I believe his disciples probably did it with six, okay? And they were close to Christ. So even if you're doing it with the twos and the threes and the fours, you're multiplying. Okay, you're multiplying for the kingdom. And that's what we've got to give ourselves to. Now, the model of our church isn't the key ingredient. We've changed the way we do things because we want to be more effective in discipleship. And we want to um, give people the opportunities to dwell together, to see lifestyles, to ask questions, uh, to talk about their lives so they can really grow in the Lord. Uh, But what is important is proximity in whatever form it takes. It's, it's closeness. It's being together. 
Jesus allowed his disciples to see his life. But he also had times of solitude and his life was a rhythm, a rhythm of going and being alone and having times of solitude, uh, seeking his father, and then times of being intentionally incarnational among people so they could see the word of God in the flesh. So however we live our lives and however it is the church and however the church is structured, uh, it has to allow for proximity to those that we're discipling, where they have time to ask questions and discover the way. Here's the third and final point I want to make about effective discipleship. You can only focus on making disciples if you don't care about getting glory in this life. Okay, this is massive. Okay, you can you can only focus on disciple making if you don't care about getting glory, if you don't care about getting headlines, if you don't care about your name being known, if, you, if, if, if you're dead to success in the eyes of the world or even in the eyes of the Christian subculture, okay, um, if we're dead to that, we can give ourselves to focusing on making disciples. If we're not dead to that, disciple making is going to be a stumbling block for us. We're going to find it very difficult. And the reason we'll find it difficult is because the vast, vast majority of discipleship that we do will never be seen by others. It's it's hidden. It's 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 the seed sowing evangelism. Okay, so yeah, we go out on the streets. Some of that gets recorded. It gets put out there. Some people, some people will see that. Okay, but it's the conversations at the bus stop. It's the conversations in the shops. Uh, it's the, it's the stuff on the streets that people don't see. It's the stuff that that, that that isn't recorded, that isn't put out there. It's the dinner table discussions where people come and eat with us and they ask real raw questions about their lives in the Lord and we help them and they spend hours there with us. It's the prayer closet wrestling with God for people to get breakthrough in their lives that we're discipling. It's those pastoral phone calls that go on for half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half when we're tired and nobody sees them, but you're 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 listening to the people that you're trying to help and you're looking to work with them and you're looking to encourage them to um, deny themselves and live for Christ. As we read the Gospels, we get the highlights of Jesus' ministry. But much of what he built into his disciples was never recorded. In fact, in John 21, verse 25, it says that not even all of his miracles were recorded. So Jesus did a lot of um, dirty work, for want of a better expression. What I mean by that is getting his hands dirty. Uh, he, 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 did a, he did a lot of that, a lot of the ordinary stuff, but a lot of the difficult stuff that was never recorded, was was never seen. Um, but that's sowed into the life of his disciples. Uh, so discipleship, it's mainly something that's unseen. And we have to be okay with giving ourselves to this, which is for God's eyes alone. We have to be willing to live as Jesus called us, where we don't do anything for the affirmation of man. Our, you know, our prayers aren't seen by man, or our fasting isn't seen by man, or our giving isn't seen by man, where we do it out of faith because we do it for his affirmation alone, that, that his affirmation over us, where he says, well done, good and faithful servant, is enough for us. Uh, there's, there's a lot of advertising today uh, from churches and from individuals about the works they're doing for the kingdom. Okay, now, sometimes some of the stuff that's put out there can be helpful, okay, in encouraging people in the faith. But sometimes it's done simply for the affirmation of man. Okay, if you're making disciples, that's not going to happen. Okay, so we need to be dead to all of that so we can sow into the lives of people. Uh, the journey of disciple making is an up and down journey and it, it requires the grace of God to stay the course and think of somebody like Peter who um, became the rock upon which Jesus would build his church and um, I think about his life and Jesus has picked this guy from obscurity 
He's sown into this guy's life. He had that close proximity to Jesus. He was the first to publicly confess Jesus as the Christ. And then he went on to have a massive fall, didn't he? And Jesus knew it was coming. He, he denied Christ. And I wonder how Jesus felt when that happened. It must have, although he knew it was coming, it must have really torn his heart and disappointed him. And that's one of the hardest things in discipleship, disappointment. And you've, you've got to be willing to walk through that. And Jesus remained faithful to him, still believing that he was going to grow in the grace of God. And then we fast forward to when Jesus ascends and there's Peter in Acts and he's seeing thousands saved. And that was after three years of Jesus investing into his life full time. And Jesus' work in Peter didn't come to fruition until after Jesus was back in heaven. And that's the thing with discipleship. It's not just for the benefit of those we're discipling. It's for the benefit of those that they're going to disciple. It's for the benefit of the generations down the line. The reason that you and I are here in the faith is because people over the years have given themselves to disciple others who've then come and shared the gospel with us and who've discipled us. It's, it's, it's the nameless, faceless ones who've given themselves to the work of the kingdom, whose uh, crown will be in heaven, whose name might never be known upon this earth. It's because of their work. It's because of their labors. It's because of their sacrifice that we are here now. And let it be said of us that um, it's because of our labors and our sacrifice and our works that people in the generations to come will know Jesus, that our works that we give will be multiplied and will help see the kingdom be extended across the earth. And so it's not for our immediate benefit, it's for the benefit of the kingdom. And that's why making disciples is the way of faith. Uh, we're putting our faith in God and in the reward that he will give us when we stand before him. So let me just say a couple of things by way of summary. Uh, Number one, discipleship's costly. Okay, it's it's the way Jesus commands, but it's a costly call. And it's costly because your true self has to be laid bare. You have to be genuinely living the life. You can't fake it if you're gonna make disciples. Okay, again, it doesn't mean you get everything right, it doesn't mean you don't have struggles, but it means that people get to see how you walk through them. And you need to be able to willing to you need to be willing to open your life up to others to see that. Uh, it's costly because it's somewhat invasive and it's somewhat disruptive. Um, you've got to allow people close and other people uh, don't always work to your timetable. Okay, so it's costly in that sense. And it's costly because it's nameless and it's faceless. It's in obedience to God and it's for his glory alone. We have to be dead to our own glory and live that he might get the glory. Uh, so it's costly, but it's also glorious. And it's glorious because it gives Jesus what he longs for. Jesus longs for a bride that's mature in love for him and that is mature in love for his church, that loves his church like he loves his church. And it's a, it's a glorious reality that we're called to labor to see the bride of Christ become mature. Uh, all heaven rejoices when one sinner returns okay and we need to keep in the forefront of our minds as we're working and as we're laboring as we're calling people back to the faith to walk in obedience to, to the lord we might get no headlines on this earth but heaven rejoices in this work it's also glorious because it's genuinely satisfying to the heart of someone who loves god to see others grow in christ we see this in the way paul talked in in 1 thessalonians 2 19 where he said to the church, he said, you know, what is my crown? What is my boasting? What is my glory? He said, is it not you? You're my crown. He's saying, look, to see you growing in maturity of the faith, he said, it's, it's my reward. It's what I long to see. And, and, and it's true. Like when you disciple someone and you see them overcoming the temptations of this world and you see them having freedom in Christ, money can't buy it. It's better than treasure. It's, it's a beautiful, glorious thing. And so I want to encourage you to give yourself to this because genuinely it's satisfying in your life to see others grow in the Lord. 
but it's also glorious because it's a ministry that stands the testing of the fire. Uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.13 that our works are going to be tested. Okay, there'll be works that look impressive in this day, which will be burnt up in the day of the Lord. And there'll be, there are works that will be unseen in this day, which are gloried in, in the day of the Lord. And they stand the testing of the fire. Um, I want you and me to give ourselves to works that are going to stand that testing. Okay, that, that, that when that fire comes, the Lord will say, what you gave yourself to was not of earthly value, it was of eternal value, it was of heavenly value. And that's what I hope we'll join together to give ourselves towards. And in that day, when we stand before Jesus, we will be pleased and we'll have no regrets of how we spent our lives to see others grow in him. Uh, so in the coming weeks, I'm going to talk about uh, our kingdom commitments. I'm going to talk about uh, how we should be living as a people of God and what we should be committed to in order that we live for him and make disciples the way he's called us to. But for now, would you pray with me uh, in response to everything I've shared today? Father, we thank you for this glorious work that you've called us to. Lord, we ask that first and foremost, we would love you with all of our hearts, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. And that, Lord, as we receive your love, that we would learn to love your church to the same measure you love her. Lord, we pray that you would deliver us from the temptation to give ourselves to that which is impressive in the sight of the world. And that, Lord, we would be given to that which pleases your heart. Thank you, Lord, that you see every cup of water given to a disciple because they're a disciple. Thank you that you see the prayers that we pray, the tears that we shed. Thank you, Lord, that you see um, the phone calls. Thank you that you see the meetings. Thank you that you see um, the evangelism and the, and the reaching out. Thank you that you see your people enduring the, the, the mocking and the, and the ridicule, Lord, as they preach the gospel. Father, we pray that your love would sustain us. And that, Lord, we would have heavenly vision. That, Lord, our, our joy and our crown would be to see you receive the church that you so desire. I pray, that just as Paul did, that we would labour and toil with all of the strength that you work within us to present to you a mature people because that is your heart. That is what you want. Pray that as long as we have breath in our lungs, that, Lord, we would work towards this end. Without you, Lord, we can do nothing. We pray that you'd give us life. We pray you'd give us sustenance. We pray that you'd bear fruit through us as we remain in you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord, and we give you glory in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. Thank you for persevering through until the end. And I hope this word has encouraged you. Uh, go forth and let's do the work of the Lord together. See you soon.